Well, let me say a very good morning to our viewers, to yourself, my brother, Wemka, and um, to the rest of the panel um, online. Um, this, let me just state emphatically, that the process has been extremely transparent because one of the earlier speakers said the process has not been transparent. In fact, this has traveled three years in parliament. We've had the longest public engagement, the gay lobby, the churches, the Muslim groups, traditional authorities have all had opportunity to make representation. In fact, this bill is what received the highest number of public memoranda, over 180. Nothing like this has ever happened in the history of parliament. Now, we've had ver various iterations of the bill, and that's a standard. With every bill that comes to parliament, as it goes through consideration stage, iterations happen. Now, on the day we, we passed the bill, that was Wednesday, I believe, the mm -hmm. 28th, um, on the 28th of, of February, what happened was um, we had heard some commentary in the media, especially led by the gay lobby, um, saying that we that this was going to introduce criminal libel and mm -hmm. gag the media. Through the back door. Clearly uninformed and not factual. However, because we were enforced in our belief that the provisions in the bill did not impose a cap or a gagging of the chapter 12 rights of the media in the 1992 constitution. Mm -hmm. We moved, I moved the motion on the floor to have, a, to have the second, another consideration of the bill and introduced a phrase in clause 10 and clause 11 of the last but one iteration of the bill. Now clause 10 says prohibition of propaganda of, promotion of, and advocacy for activities prohibited under this act. And this is what has the gay lobby the most pained. But, and then 11 says, prohibition of propaganda of, promotion of, and advocacy for activities directed at the child. Now, what we then did was to say that before you, if you read 10 one, it says a person who, A, through a medium technological platform and goes on and on and on and on. But what we then did was to introduce subject to the constitution, Subject to the provisions of the constitution. Mm. That was the phrase. But if you complete that, Sam George, yes. it talks about broadcasts, disseminates, yes. publishes, or yes. distributes, yes. or uses an electronic device, yes. the internet service, yes. a film, or any other device yes. capable of electronic storage or transmission to produce, procure, market, broadcast, disseminate, publish, or distribute a material for purposes of promoting an activity prohibited under this act. Yes, so once parliament passes a law and says something is illegal, mm -hmm. why, don't you, why don't you advocate and disseminate material on anti-money laundry? Because parliament has passed a law that says that money laundry is criminal. Mm -hmm. So there's a difference between an editorial and advocacy. Mm -hmm. Your editorial, something always has something at stake. It mm -hmm. does an editorial. You can have an editorial on money laundering. In fact, a conversation on this platform on money laundering, which was an editorial piece by Samson, mm -hmm. is what led me to pass comments that said that the real estate industry in Ghana is, being, is, a, is a tool for money laundering. Mm -hmm. You remember that incident mm -hmm. between myself and Greta? Yeah. So it's different to do an editorial on the dangers of LGBTQ, of violence even against that community, extrajudicial violence okay. against that community. You can very well do an editorial on that, but that your editorial policy and discretion, your chapter 12 rights in the constitution do not give you the power to then begin to advocate for it. And that's what the gay lobby is doing. The gay lobby is engaged in advocating for the acceptance of something that parliament is passing a legislation to say is unconstitutional. Mm. So basically we just introduce subject to the provisions of the constitution so that it gives assurances double sure to the media that your rights to inform and again, let's be clear, your chapter 12 rights give you the power or the rights to inform, mm -hmm. educate, and entertain, mm -hmm. not to carry out advocacy for illegal activity. And so let's be clear on that. Now, I have heard the comments that say that, and the gay lobby is clear, it's not that they want amendments to the bill. They want the bill out. out. Now, the gay lobby is contradicting itself. Because I've heard persons even on this platform say, that, oh, the bill is unnecessary because there are existing legislation that deal with all the issues that the bill is dealing with. You don't find those existing legislation offensive to the Constitution. But when we pick all of those provisions and aggregate them into one legislation, 
then it becomes offensive. What logic and what intelligence is that? That if you take the child's act of child, the children's act of Ghana today, mm -hmm. it prohibits anybody who is not a heterosexual from being allowed to adopt or foster a child. That is in the children's act. Mm -hmm. Now you put that provision in this law. The professors and the uh, gay lobby have not found the Children's Act offensive to the Constitution. But as soon as you put it in the anti-LGBTQ bill, it becomes offensive to the Constitution. The Marriage Act of Ghana does not recognize a marriage consummated between a man, a man or persons of the same sex. We put that in this bill. Boom, it becomes unconstitutional. Why? There is a new definition for unconstitutional? Again, we are told that the bill offends the Constitution. In all the conversation that is being made everywhere, be it by the gay lobby, be it by the Strach boss, yourself without, none of them points out what portion of the Constitution is being offended. What they do is quickly run to Article 17 of the Constitution mm -hmm. and say that Article 17 says all persons shall be equal before the law. The first thing you are taught in law school is that you don't read the Constitution as a part. You read it as a whole. They read 17.1, but fail to go and read 17.4, which says, nothing in this article, which is the 17, shall prevent parliament. So despite it saying that the all persons shall be equal before the law, it says nothing in article 17 shall prevent parliament from enacting laws that are reasonably necessary to provide A, for the implementation of policies and programs aimed at redressing, listen, social economic and educational imbalances in the Ghanaian society. This is a social issue. And so parliament is within the same Article 17.4, exercising its rights that the Constitution has conferred on us to deal with the social issue. It says for the matters relating to adoption, which is in this bill, marriage in this bill, divorce, burial, devolution of property. But clearly, parliament has not acted ultra virus the Constitution. So again, they don't know or what they're saying doesn't hold water. And I'm, I'm happy for them to go. Then it is shocking to hear the Shiraj boss and members of the gay lobby say that you cannot enact legislation on the basis of cultural imperatives. Mm -hmm. Why? Which law school did they attend, respectfully? Have they read Chapter 6 of the Constitution, the Directive Principles of State Policy, and read Article 39? At, why? So is, at, what is Article 39 doing in the Constitution? Is Article 39 in the Constitution just there for, for, for fancy sake, Article 39 says cultural objectives and imposes this as a directive principle of state policy. And it says that subject to clause 2 of Article 39, the state shall take steps to in, encourage the integration of appropriate customary values okay. into the fabric of national life through formal and informal education and the conscious introduction of cultural dimensions to relevant aspects of national planning. So how the Shraj boss can make a comment of that nature and it's being re echoed by the gay lobby shocks me because the directive principles of state policy are a cardinal part of our constitution. Again, let me go to the fundamental freedoms, the general freedoms in the constitution. The general freedoms in the constitution are established in Article 21. And, and I'm happy the former Deputy Attorney General is here. And he's noting. He, he's, a, he's a senior lawyer who would be able to correct me or any other person. On, on what the position of the law. When you read the tw Article 21, General Fundamental Freedoms, it expresses all the freedoms, freedom of speech and expression, freedom of thought, conscience and belief, freedom to practice any religion, freedom of assembly, freedom of association, freedom of information, and freedom of movement. But then again, it goes to 21.4. And 21.4, he says, a person, he says, nothing in or done under the authority of a law shall a law like what we are passing, mm -hmm. shall be held to be inconsistent with or in contravention of this article, which is 21, which lists all the fundamental freedoms, to the extent that the law in question makes provision for in E, that which is reasonably required for the purpose of safeguarding the people of Ghana against the teaching or propagation of a doctrine which exhibits or encourages disrespect for the nationhood of Ghana, the national symbols and emblems, or inside hatreds against other members of the community, except so far as that provision, or as the case may be, the thing done under the authority of that law is shown not to be reasonably justifiable in terms of the spirit of this constitution. 
So we are entreated, despite the general fundamental freedoms, mm -hmm. to curtail those freedoms by an act of parliament, insofar as it is reasonably possible to deal against people like the gay lobby who are teaching or propagating a doctrine that exhibits or encourages disrespect for the nationhood of Ghana. Okay. So, look, we are clear. And the last point I will make, Professor Buckwin makes that point. And Prof, you are 100% you are correct. You may not be an expert in, 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 in uh, uh, traditions and culture, but by purpose of this bill, I have worked closely with the National House of Chiefs. In fact, the fourth public symposium, and that tells you how much work, for those who say we've not been transparent, we've held public engagements, apart from what Parliament did, as sponsors. The fourth one was sponsored by the National House of Chiefs in Kumasi at the Center for National Culture. And the president of the National House of Chiefs was present. We have over 80 languages in Ghana, over 150 ethnic groups in Ghana. Not one, not one ethnic group accepts homosexuality as a cardinal part of that ethnic group, their culture or traditions. I, I challenge the gay lobby and anybody on this platform to show me one ethnic group that has embraced homosexuality. Again, I challenge them to show us any one of our 80 languages that has a word, word for homosexuality. Mm. In our local dialects, what, what is a foreign construct are described by phrases. So for example, if, if you are speaking about in Chi, which is a very common language I love people speak, if you're talking about the computer, because the computer is a later day ad addition to our social, our, the etymology of the Akan language, it is described as a barefoot ifidye. It is not a word, it's a description. Mm -hmm. When you talk about telephones, again, a new construct is called a we, we, we describe them. Okay. Now, when it comes to homosexuality, how do we call it? We don't have a word for it. But we have a description it, for it. It brings me to that kind of description, and yes. um, we'll get to whether we'll get an assent to it or not, and the concerns about the 18 civil society groups going to the Supreme Court amongst others. Some key questions have come up. How are you going to prove that someone is gay or a lesbian, transgender amongst others? Really, how are you going to prove that? By just you, saying you, that I am I, the law, I fall foul of the law? I'm grateful to you that you have now brought us to the real application of the law. And that's what the gay lobby should be applying their mind to. Look, everybody in this country has a right to a fair hearing before a competent court of jurisdiction. And if you read the law as it is, where it criminalizes the offenses, there is a burden of proof on the prosecution to adduce evidence before incontrovertible evidence of the committing of the offense. And that's why I've, kept, I've always said that some George and the sponsors of the bill don't care what goes on in the privacy of your bedroom. Ah, MFA, do I know what went on in your bedroom? No. Do I know what went on in Pemka's bedroom? Do you know what went on in my bedroom or in Shekari Meyal's bedroom th this morning? No. Or last night? No. Unless anybody comes out to state that this is what I have done or brings evidence or produces evidence, you choose to go and record yourself. And that falls into the wrong hands. Recently, there was a video from a secondary school in Ghana mm -hmm. that showed persons in the act. That in itself will form circumstantial evidence before a competent court of jurisdiction but, for but recording. The, the, the issue about the abuse of this particular act, or if it becomes law, is that by looking like I am female, but if I display tendencies of being a male... It doesn't mean you're going to be you sent say, to jail. Okay. It, means that, it means that you will have because your... Because you your, just mentioned the Kojo Besia issue. Yes. Because we have people it will in have, it, that You will like have it. your day in court. You'll be given an opportunity to defend yourself. Nobody is picking people off the streets or from their bedrooms and throwing them in in Sawa. Isn't that where no. the issue of violation of take... my human rights comes no, no, up? No, because no, by how, looking how? like it, how? people would say no, that I am. No, the person who makes the report, and that's why we have clause uh, section 17 or clause 17 in the bill, which is duty to report and pro section. section 17, mm. which says duty to report and prohibition of extrajudicial treatment. So 17.1 says that a person who has knowledge that an offense is committed under this act mm -hmm. shall report the commission of the offense to a police officer or in the absence of a police officer to a relevant authority of the community in which the offense is committed. Two says a relevant authority to whom a report is made under subsection one shall within three days of the report ensure that the report is lodged at the nearest police station. And we we'll define who a relevant authority okay. is, traditional authority. Then this is where the catch is. 17.3. Section 84 to 87 
of the Criminal Offenses Act mm -hmm. 1960, Act 29, shall apply to a person who commits a misdemeanor if that person verbally or physically abuses, assaults, or harasses a person accused of an offense under this act or suffering from any gender or sexual identity challenge, including LGBTQA+, the stigma. So that's okay. stigma. So mm -hmm. clearly, this is the first time you have a legislation under which any person who is accused of an offense, of being a member of the gay community, can say to the police, I have been ve even verbal assault or physical assault. The person is subjected to article sections 84 to 87 of the Criminal Offenses Act. And you can be, you can be jailed for it. Okay. Because if you read it, for those, there, are, there are jail terms assigned to it or a fine. So if people say that this law is discriminatory, they should just take their time. Take away the emotions and read. And let's be intellectual for once. Okay. Let me bring